Now that we lost, and, and a part of what we're trying to do now is to restore that mindset to the body of Christ. And one of the reasons I got caught up last year when I was here in April with the whole uh, mindset of this school is I thought, you know, if we can change a mindset of students, we won't have to change their mindset when they get to be my age, which had happened with me. See, I've been doing this for 40 years now, but for 32, 33 years, I, I was really mixed up, didn't have a clue, was operating with a, with a wrong worldview about ministry, and therefore was, uh, as I was doing this, I was proclaiming things that were influencing people sometimes in the wrong direction. And now, my biggest barrier to getting the message about ministry in the workplace, my biggest barrier is those who have been pastors for 30 years. They're the hardest to convince. I don't have any trouble convincing business people. They already know they're in ministry. They heard it direct from God. They're called. They're walking it out. But I can't break through the hierarchy of church structure and church leadership. So I'm going to back up and quit trying to just do that and come back to this level and see if we can't develop new mindsets at the very early stages. So we are here blatantly trying to influence your life, to influence your thinking and to get you, in some cases, to change the way you think, in other cases, to give you new terminology to fit with the way you think, and in other cases, to confirm what you already know to be the truth. So you can say, I already know all this. Well, then we'll confirm it and settle it and give you more uh, illustrations and examples, more scripture to go with it, more background for it. If you don't have this mindset yet, open your mind right now. How many of you know it's important to change? If, without change, progress is impossible. Let me tell you something about revelation. I just, I just figured this out the other day. When you get revelation, it's not really revelation unless when you first hear it, you say, I don't think that's true. I mean, if you hear something and your first thought is that's true, it means you already knew it. It's just confirming it. But when you hear a new thought and it comes to you and say, I'm not real sure about that, then as it progresses, you begin to say, oh, yes, now I accept that. That's revelation. So if I say something to you that you don't quite hold on to, you don't, when it first comes out of my mouth, you say, ooh, I don't know about that. Just hang on long enough and see if it begins to take hold and it will be revelation for you of some new level of understanding and new level of truth. Amen? Are you ready for new? Now, it could be that you're so far ahead of the rest of the body of Christ that everything I say will be old to you. It could be. But I know this much. I've been, I was a local church pastor for 35 years. For the last five years, I've been traveling the broader body of Christ, and I am still discovering new things almost every day. And so I'm pretty sure there's some new things for you to discover today as well. So we're just going to be open to the new. And uh, then to think about what is our purpose here? What, what is your purpose in serving God? Souls are at the bottom line. But it's got to be more than souls. Because if it's just souls, get them saved and send them to heaven. Hold, hold them under the baptistry long enough that they go, that they go straight to heaven. It's souls, but the next step is transform souls to transform cities, nations, states. So it is souls. That's the beginning level, but it's got to be more than that. See, so, you know, that's the level at which we start. It's souls. Hallelujah. Nothing of a higher priority. But if we stop there, we stop short of really where God wants to take us. Think of this verse, Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Jesus said, he was talking to Zacchaeus, and then he gave a parable following that. But he said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save. What's the next phrase? That which was lost. That, not those that were lost. Now think about that. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We usually think those that were lost, and that's a part of that which was lost, those, but it's not all of that. Hmm. What else was lost when man sinned besides men's souls? What else was lost? Was there anything else lost? 
communion with God, fellowship with God, the whole God-man relationship was lost. Few other things were lost. Dominion and authority, we lost the power that God had given us in Genesis 1:28 to take dominion over the earth, subdue it. And the reason we lost that is because we lost our mindset about what work was all about. God created us with the mindset to work, to cooperate with him. I'm going to show you this in the Bible in just a moment. But we need to understand that when Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, we need to go back, we need to go after that, not just those. So, our first calling and priority is those that were lost, the souls. But in addition to that, we need to teach those that were lost how to now live their life in the fullness of kingdom reality so that they are now a part of fulfilling the Great Commission and reaching the entire nation by changing the, the, the spiritual climate over the cities and nations in which we live. That's really the terminology that I like to use, that our calling is to change the spiritual climate. So that means we change the, those that are lost, we get them saved, but we also change the whole mindset of what this world is all about, why we're here, those that we should love, and how are we going to fulfill that? Now tomorrow, if, if the Lord lets me do this, I've got a whole new teaching that I'm going to be doing on wealth transfer and God's plan and God's only design to transfer wealth out of darkness into light. There's a lot of teaching about, you know, the, the wealth is stored up for the righteous and we're going to inherit that. But many of us misunderstand that. But I, I'm going to teach that tomorrow because I think that's a part of what we lost. I think we lost some understanding and moved into this miracle mindset. Now, miracles are good, but you know, you only need a miracle if you're in trouble. <laughs> I mean, you only need a miracle if you're sick. Now, would you rather get a miracle when you're sick or live in superabundant health? See, I'd rather just stay healthy all the time and then not need my miracle. But most of us have, have set our mindset to expect the miraculous because we've not been geared to live the supernatural. So I want to talk about that tomorrow, about God's plan to transfer wealth into our hands. But today I want to talk to you about kind of the history of God's creation of man. Now I've got a PowerPoint presentation. You can follow along with that or in your Bible. So let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Now in Genesis chapter 2, it's interesting to me that God is already giving a history lesson of what happened in Genesis chapter 1. But if you get to Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, it says this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Now, that's interesting. They were just created in chapter 1 of Genesis, but by chapter 2, God is giving you a history lesson to remind you of what he has just done. So these verses here in Genesis chapter 2 are really a reminder of what God has just done. Now, we need to get this in our mindset because if you get a prophetic word from God that comes to you, it's real and yet it has not yet been fulfilled. You understand what I'm talking about? Somebody gives you a word, you take it into your life, then later on it will be manifested. And so when did it become real? When did that prophetic, when was it true, the prophetic word? When was it real? When it was first spoken or when it happened? <laughs> and I'd never thought of that question before, but I think I got two different answers here from the crowd, and you're probably both right. But the reality is if we really believe it was the Word of God, then it was real the moment it was spoken, even though it had not yet, not yet been manifested in our life. See, I've got some words over my life that have not yet come to fulfillment, but I believe they're going to come so strongly that as far as I'm concerned, they're already true. They're already, they're already there. So it's kind of like that here in Genesis 1 and 2. God creates, and then he tells us about what he's created. And so we come to this in verse number 4, and it says, it's up there on the screen, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Now watch this, verse 5, before any plant of the field was in the earth. So God says way, way back, when I just had put the earth here, I hadn't even planted anything yet. There was no herb in the field. 
And it says, in fact, that God had not even caused it to rain on the earth yet. And then it says, there was no man there to till the ground. Now, the word till is the first reference in the Bible to work. That word can be translated work. And God, think of it this way. God says, I can't put any plants in the ground. I can't let it rain. I can't let it rain or put plants there because I have no man to till the ground. In other words, Almighty God, the all-powerful God, the God for whom nothing is impossible, by his own design, has to withhold something because he needs you and I to help him to fulfill it. Can you just let that settle for a minute and see how important you are to God, I, us, men and women, I, the, the creation of the, of the human force on the earth had certain things in God's plan had to be withheld until we came on the scene because God needs us. Now, you already knew that, didn't you? You already know that God is not going to save souls lest he sends evangelists. How will they hear without a preacher? So we know that God needs us for that kind of work. But did you know that the whole work mindset that God gives is built with you in mind? He can't even let something grow until you're there to take care of it. All right, let's take a look at the next screen there, my uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. Somebody's running it for me. I appreciate it very much. So there's no herb, no rain, no plant, no man. These are the things that are the realities there. Nothing has been planted and it hasn't even rained yet. In fact, God couldn't cause it to rain yet because as soon as he causes rain to come, the plants start to grow. And if the plants start to grow before we're there, then it's chaos because now everything's growing, but there's no person to till it or to cultivate the ground. So I want you to see that work is a part of God's destiny for your life. A lot of people today, as I mentioned at the very beginning, don't like their jobs. In fact, most Americans hate their job, and a part of the reason is that they don't understand destiny. They don't understand God's purpose for their life. They don't like their job because they don't want to work because they have no concept that that's the purpose for which God created them. Now, if you can get that there at the very foundational level, how many of you have a job right now? Now, be real honest with me. How many of you love your job? Oh, good. Good share of you do. Kind of fed you a little bit on this before I had you vote on that. Some of you don't like your jobs, and before this time is over, you should start liking your job. You say, well, that job only has one purpose, it's to get me through school. No, that's not the only purpose of your job. God put you on that job to influence there. God put you there to be a force for his kingdom. You say, but Rich, you don't understand my job. Well, yeah, I, I probably do understand your job. You say, but man, they're evil, wicked, mean, bad, and nasty down there. But that's why you're there. You see, that's why you're there. You're there to bring in the opposite spirit to what everybody else is operating there. You say, yeah, but they lie there. Well, that's why you're there. They're not honest. That's why you're there. They're not godly. That's why you're there. They gossip. That's why you're there. See, all the reasons that you could say why you don't like it there is really the reason why God put you there. So you need to start thinking, when I go to this job, as menial as it is, oh God, I don't want to be here all of my life, but I want to know that this day I have a purpose at this place so that I can fulfill more than just getting a paycheck to pay for school and get me on to what my real calling is. In fact, some of you out of this little experience with this little job right now are going to discover your real purpose. Some of you will think, Oh, thank you, God, you called me to ministry. And then you're going to find out that's it. That's the ministry to which he called me. It's not a bad thing. Not all of you. Many of you will be called to do something else. I was called a pastor, and I did it for, I've done it for now 40 years. I know that was my calling and my destiny, but I've come to understand that the, the, the man or the woman that was called to serve him in a business place is just as called as I am. There's no, it's no, not, a, not one is a higher call. My call is the highest one for me, but your call is the highest for you. So for my brother, the highest call 
that there was in the world was the one that he chose to follow. My brother, as a businessman, is influencing people I, as a pastor, can never touch. And he's influencing them with real power and integrity because he's known across America as an honest businessman, a man of integrity, in a business that doesn't usually operate with a high level of integrity. He operates at that level of integrity. So people trust him completely, and they know because he tells them that it's because of Jesus. So he's making influence through his business in a way that I could never make as a pastor. So I have an influence over a sphere of influence as a pastor, but he has influence over a nationwide audience in his business setting. Now, you need to understand that some of you will find in this little menial get-me-through-school job, you will find purpose and destiny right there. Understanding that that's why God put you there. Now, how many of you were raised on a farm? Okay. How many of you are still working in the farming industry today? Yeah, that's interesting. Not many of us today are still in it. Uh, but, but a good group here were, was raised in a farming atmosphere. So I want you to think right now. I want you to switch your thinking. Go back here with me to Genesis 2 and say, in the beginning, all of the work was farming. It was cultivating. It was tilling. It was taking care of the plants that were planted there. But since that isn't my particular area of expertise or call, I want you, whenever we read here in Genesis 2, your creation or your ground, I want you in your mind to make the switch to either the, way, the, the job that you have or the one you believe you're called to or the one that you were raised in, the one that your family was a part of. Can you just make a switch with me? When you hear ground, think computers. When you hear, when you hear creation, think sales uh, or think preaching or think missionary or think teaching, whatever it might be that you're called to. When you hear it here in Genesis 2 and 3, can you make that switch with me? How many of you can just click that quick? So you're going to read one thing, think another. Read what everybody was working the ground at that time. Since I'm not working the ground, then I'll apply it to my own particular place and calling. So now that's verse 4 and 5. Now the next verse we see is verse 7. And it says, the Lord God formed man. Let's go to the next slide. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. That's verse 7. Verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man that he had formed. So now watch the progression. God says, I'm going to give you a history of the earth. Before there was any plant, before there was any rain, there was no man. Then I created man. Then I planted the garden. You cannot miss this. God put you here to work with him in his work. He put you here to work with him in his work. So you find out what God is working at, you involve yourself in it, come alongside him. Your work now is not just your labor, but it's co-laboring with God. It's cooperating with God. It's getting in on what God is doing. It's landing your life side by side with his, where he does the hard work, and I do the tilling, the tending, the, the more easy work, the less stressful work. In fact, in Genesis chapter 2, there's no stress in work. In Genesis 2, there's no toil in work. In Genesis 2, there's no sweat in work. In Genesis 2, you don't get a heart attack from your work. In Genesis 2, you don't get stressed out because of your work. Because in Genesis 2, God is doing the tough work, and we're just coming alongside and working with him. That was his plan. That was his plan from the very beginning. Let's go to the next slide, see, what, see what's there. So here's the, here's the form. The man is formed. The garden is planted. Work is established. Work is to be cooperation with God. Work is not a result of the fall, which some will tell you, Oh, I hate my job, but you know, it's just a part of the fall. When, we, when sin came in, work came in. No. When sin came in, a curse came, but the work wasn't the curse. So for those of you who think your particular job is the curse, that's not true. 
Now, it may well be that you're getting a result of the curse through your job, but we can break that, and I'm going to show you how in a few uh, minutes this morning. So work is the purpose plan of God for our lives. So God made us to work. Now, that for those of us who are called to serve God, those of us who are committed to making sure that the kingdom is expanded throughout the world, that should give us a new understanding of what work is all about. In fact, right there, you should change your mind and say, wow, I like work. I like work because that's, why God, that's the way God made me. That's why God put me here. God put me here to work. If God put me here to win souls, then I'm going to win souls. If God put me here to work, then I'm going to work. God put me here to work and win souls, and I'm going to work and win souls because God created me in his mind to work. Now, I started working when I was, I started working every weekend and after school when I was in seventh grade. And so from seventh grade on, I've always had a weekend job, after school job, a summer job, all the way through junior high, all the way through high school. Just, work has been just something that I did. But a lot of people weren't trained with the mindset that work is okay. In fact, as I said, most people don't like to work. I run into people all the time that want to retire early. They want to retire early so that they don't have to work anymore. Well, what are they going to do with their time? Well, they're going to go and play golf, or they're going to go and whatever. So, I, I tell you, you know what happens to retired people? I don't want to be brutally honest, but most of them die. And that's what happens when you retire. You lose purpose. You lose direction. I run into retired people that retire and say, man, two weeks of retirement and I'm ready to go back to work. And then they go get second job, third job, another career, move on. Man, I, I tell you right now, I plan to keep going. I have no retirement plan. I'm just going to keep working until I get to go home to be with Jesus. Because I think that's why God created me. I cannot find the retirement concept in the Bible. Now, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the wrong audience here. Most of you are not thinking about retirement. But, but on the other hand, you need to start thinking now because I, I know 20-year-olds that think I'm going to retire by the time I'm 40. What are you going to do from then on? It's just there's a lot more joy in fulfilling purpose by working, and that's really what God called us to do. I was getting on an airplane in San Jose, which is where I live, and the guy in front of me, I recognized the back of his head. He says, white hair. We're getting on an airplane. He's got on a suit, white shirt, shine shoes. I mean, this guy, the classiest looking man in the airport. And he turned around, I poked him and he turned around. And I said, hey, Jim. He said, hey, Rich, how you doing? Well, Jim is 85 years old. I said, Jim, where are you going? I'm going on a business trip. Jim had retired from the military after 20 years. Then he went to work for Bank of America, mandatory requirement at age 65. So he went to work for a second bank, mandatory requirement at age 75. He went to work for a third bank. They made him retire at age 79. So he's retired four times. Now, when I meet him, he's at age 85. He's the vice president of a company that's about to go public. And I said, Jim, what do you do for them? He said, I handle the retirement accounts, <laughs> which, is, which makes sense, of course. And I said, are you going to retire? He said, are you kidding? He said, all my friends that retired have already died and gone to heaven. So I'm just going to keep on working. Now, he was finding joy in his work at age 85. He's on a business trip. I said, Jim, you are my hero. I'm going to be like you at age 85. I'm getting on a plane and going on a business trip. I'm going to still be kicking it for Jesus when I'm 85 because that's the way it ought to be. I'm just going to keep on, keep on, keep on. So Jim says, hey, can we sit together? We're on the same plane. He goes up to the girl at the counter and says to her, uh, she was pretty sharp, because he said, hey, this is my former pastor. Can we sit together? She said, former pastor, huh? Who left, you or him? Just, just pretty quick, you know. Well, at any rate, Jim and I got to sit together. He was the one that left, but it's all right. Uh, we got to sit together on the plane. And so he says to me, uh, what are you doing now? So I opened my computer, and I'm showing him my PowerPoints about 
ministering to business people and saying your work is your and he says that's what I'm doing and so we settled the issue in about an hour that Jim's doing the right thing and I slipped out of the plane to go to the restroom when I came back Jim had moved across the aisle another guy was sitting next to me I said who are you <laughs> he said Jim told me I need to talk to you now when you're 85 years old and you look like Jim you tell everybody on the plane what to do they just do it so so this guy says I'm supposed to talk to you well it turns out he lives in Detroit Michigan owns an anti-terrorist company in fact he was doing a anti-terrorist training at the Detroit Metro Airport on 9-11 when the attacks hit the World Trade Center so he says Detroit was the first airport in the nation to close down because we were there doing this thing and he's running for Congress in the state of Michigan so he says Jim says I need to talk to you so I'm telling him about his business and his run for Congress as being a part of his ministry and he's getting all excited about this as well and Jim leans across and says hey you about done I said why he said this guy next to me needs you now, had the flight been long enough, Jim would have had me to everybody on the airplane. He'd have just kept moving around until we covered the plane. So finally, I go over and talk to that guy. Then Jim and I, just before we land in St. Louis, Jim and I are back by each other. I said, Jim, I really appreciate the help, but let me explain to you, that's the old paradigm. The old paradigm is where you take people to the pastor. The new paradigm is where you do it yourself. See, you don't need for me to talk to this guy to convince him you do it. See, the old paradigm was send him to the pastor, he'll take care of it. That's the minister. The new paradigm is we're all in ministry. We all do it. We don't have to send them anywhere. We do it ourselves. That's why, that's why this training that you're getting here at this school is so valuable for you, no matter what your life profession ends up being, because whatever it is, you're the one that's going to do it. You're not going to be just having to send people to the pastor or having people send them to you as the pastor, but we're going to release the entire body of Christ to minister like we ought to be ministering. You see, if it's up to the pastor, then there's a very limited amount of work can get done. So Jim, by this time, he's got it. Jim is now ready to carry on, and I can only imagine the next few plane flights that Jim was on, what might have happened there. So get into your mind right now. I don't need to retire. I can work at this until I go to heaven, and it won't be like stress because I'm going to learn the joy of work. Work for me is going to become a life calling. I'm going to enjoy it, and I'm going to enjoy it in the way that God has called me to do it, and I'm going to fulfill it for him. Hallelujah. So we're settling the issue right now with a new grid laid over our worldview that my life is ministry. I don't go into ministry, I am ministry. Like, you know, you don't go into the church, <laughs> you are the church. So wherever I go, that's the church, and wherever I go, that's ministry because that's who I am. All right? Now let's see the next, the next uh, slide up here. There are three words for work here in Genesis 2. One is in... Uh, Actually, there's two different Hebrew words, but three words that are given. Two are in verse 15, and one is in verse 5. Verse 5, it says, there's no man to till the ground. That's the Hebrew word abad. And then there's that word abad shows up again in uh, verse 15, and then also in uh, verse 15 is the word shamar. To till, to tend. Verse 15 reads like this. Then the Lord God took man, put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep. So the word to tend is the same as the word to till and to keep. So there's these two Hebrew words, abad and shamar. Now I want to just give you a really un-Hebrew Hebrew lesson. This is the kind of Hebrew, not that you learn from studying Hebrew, but that you learn from reading Vines and Strong's. All right? So just a little basic Hebrew lesson here. Let's go to the next slide. These two words are translated these ways. Abad is to serve or to cultivate. To cultivate. Think of this. To cultivate in English is the same word from which we get the word culture. In fact, what I believe God is saying is when you go to work, I want you to develop culture there at work. Your purpose for going to work is that you are presenting there the presence of God in that place so that the culture changes by your presence there. You're cultivating the presence of God into that place. How do you do it? Just by being 
if you will just be the presence, you can change people's lives. Do you believe that? Is it possible to win people to Christ without ever preaching Jesus? Is it possible? I'll tell you what it is. Can I tell you a little story? I just, uh, a month ago, I was in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is not really your Christian hotspot for missionaries, or is it your hotspot for vacationing? So I wasn't there to vacation, and I wasn't there as a Christian pastor missionary. The only way I could get into Afghanistan was as a business consultant, which is really kind of cool when you think about it. I'm a pastor, and I've been a pastor for 40 years. But I got into Afghanistan as a business consultant because I work with business people nowadays, so I could go in there under a humanitarian organization as a consultant slash trainer of business people. But I couldn't tell them that I was a Christian. In fact, if, my, if the name pastor or minister is in my passport, I'm not going to Afghanistan. In fact, if Israel's in my passport, I'm not going to Afghanistan because there's still a little tension, you understand, here between Afghanistan and Israel. So I go to Afghanistan, called there. I mean, this was like quick. Two weeks before, they said, can you come? And I said, no, I don't have any time. And they said, we need to have you. So I said, I have six days in my schedule. They said, that'll work. Two days to get there, two days to get home, two days to be there. So that's what I did. I went to Afghanistan in six days. It takes you two days to get there. It takes you two days to get back. I was there two days. And they worked me the whole time I was there. So I'm doing business conferences in Afghanistan for business people, and I'm training the students at Kabul University. Kabul is the capital city of Afghanistan. So Kabul University is where I'm getting my students from. All of them are Muslim. None of them are Christians. None of them even know that we are Christians. None of them think that I'm there as a Christian. They think I'm there as a business consultant. Now, the reality is Afghanistan has been in war for 25 years, so they've had no training. Their university, which in the 60s was a good, strong university, had dwindled down to 300 students in the year 2001. Now there are 12,000 students. So, I mean, this, stu this, this school has just exploded under freedom. By the way, the Afghans love the Americans. They love us. They, are th they love the B-52s also. They especially love the B-52 bombers, which routed the Taliban out and have set them free so that they can rebuild their nation with freedom. Now, I don't want to get involved in your politics, but let me tell you something. That part of the world is grateful for the help that our nation has brought to them. And they're very open to me as an American businessman because we can help them to rebuild their nation. So if you can imagine that I am, I'm very used to being a public speaker, but I'm not used to not being able to use the Bible. And I'm not accustomed to not being able to share Jesus. And I'm sure not accustomed to not being able to lead people to an understanding of who God is. And so I'm there in Afghanistan to do two and a half days. I got in on Sunday and left Wednesday. So they started Sunday afternoon, all day Monday, and all day Tuesday with these seminars. And yet I couldn't do what I'm doing here. And yet I want to get to the same place. I want to get them to the same understanding that I want to get you to. This is a challenge. I mean, I'll tell you, this is stretching me to my limit. I was glad I had a 24-hour plane flight because I had to study the whole flight. I mean, I'm, I'm taking notes the whole time. I'm redoing all of my messages into, quote, non-Christian-looking messages. They're all Christian messages because the biblical principles will work even if you just say, here's the truth. An ancient proverb says, and I discovered when I got there that it's quite all right to talk about a holy book because they love the holy book. So I could say, it's written in the holy book. In fact, we taught them the Ten Commandments. He said, write these down, Ten principles for your business from a holy book. Okay, they're all ready to write. <laughs> we taught them the Ten Commandments. The next day, 
let's go through those 10 principles from a holy book for your business, and they all come back with the 10 commandments. I mean, this is awesome what we were able to do. So at the end of the time, the young man that's my translator, and he is a Muslim who is translating for me, and he's translating because he's the best student in the English class at Kabul University. Now just throw this out to you, for some of you who have missionary vision in your heart. Right now, Kabul University wants to teach their students English. The choices are English or Farsi. And if we teach them Farsi, they're going with Iran and Iraq. If we teach them English, they're going to connect with America, and the potential for the gospel is great. So they are crying, please send us English teachers. We have a team of 30 people there right now in this Christian group that I'm with. They don't know that we're Christian. A team of 30 people, most of them are from the Philippines, who are there teaching English at the University of Kabul. Teaching 250 students at a time. English. Now, if you've studied a foreign language, you know that you need a little interaction with your teacher to get it best. They're teaching 250 students at a time English because there are 6,000 students, 250 per class that these 30 teachers are teaching right now. Each one of these teachers is developing friends. And while I was there, one of the gals said, my three, the three Folks in my oikos, my fellowship group, all accepted Jesus this week. At the end of the time, my interpreter, the young man they gave to me to interpret all of my seminars, said, are you guys Christians? Yes. I like the way you act. I like being around you. Could you help me become a Christian? This is just by being in the presence. I, I tell you, folks. You don't always have to preach and lead to an invitation. You can develop a culture that changes the atmosphere that draws people into the kingdom without ever telling them what your mindset, purpose, and intention is. And I believe that's what God wants us to do at work. That's why he uses this word cultivate, and I'm asking you now to translate that, not just to cultivating ground, but to your job, your work, your place of influence, wherever it might be, wherever you have influence, think, God put me there to cultivate or develop culture or influence people into the kingdom by the presence of God that is in me, shining out through me to a world that needs to know. Now, folks, if we can do that in Afghanistan, surely we can do that in Florida. Surely we can do that in the United States. Surely you could do that on your job. It's the same God in you that was the God in me, and yet God just loves to develop culture and atmosphere where he can shine through and where he can be the most effective. By the way, if you become a full-time church worker, we can't get you into Afghanistan. But if you'll go get a job at a business, I can get you into Afghanistan tomorrow. Now, not everybody's called to the Muslim world. In fact, personally, I've never felt called to the Muslim world. I love the Muslims, but somebody else can reach the Muslims. I have other arenas in which I need to work. I do a lot of work in other parts of the world. The last weekend of July, God placed the Muslim world in my heart, and I can't get it out. It kept me up all night, about three nights in a row. He's given me dreams about Saddam Hussein. I mean, things I don't even understand now. But all of a sudden, I have this love for the Muslim world. God does these strange things. He'll give you love for a certain group of people. Some of you will get a love for the Muslims. And you'll say, how can I get to them? Well, I can't go as a preacher, a youth worker, or worship leader. How can I get there? Oh, I'll develop a business. They'll welcome me in. I'll go. And you will go to the Muslim world out of business. And business becomes mission. Or business becomes ministry. We think bivocational, but God never thinks bivocational. God thinks you're one person. Your business, your ministry, they're the same thing. It's not like two parts of your life. It's all one. I'll get to this a little bit later, talk to you about that some more. But I'm just saying to you now that whatever you're calling, you can fulfill it if you'll just begin to let God work it out for you. 
Now, just look at a little bit more here. Also, this word abod, we get another Hebrew word, abodah, sometimes spelled A-V-O-D-A-H or A-B-O-D-H, which is translated in the Old Testament to work, to serve, or to worship. Now, think about this for a minute. The same word is translated worship that's translated work. The same word is translated both as work and worship. Why would that be the case? Why would you get work and worship as the same Hebrew word? Anybody got an idea? Why would they be the same? Because when you're working, that's worshiping because that's what God called you to do. Excellent. Because God called me to work, therefore, see, how many ways are there to worship God? Singing is one, praying is one, giving is one, working is one. Because when I work, I'm fulfilling my purpose that God put me here for. Therefore, work becomes worship. Also, work and worship are closely connected so that even when I'm worshiping God, it is one of the best ways to prepare me for my work. The best training for your work, job, whatever it might be, is worship. Why? Because that gets God in you, and God is the one who helps you to do your job. He gives you help beyond your training manual. So your best tool to get you prepared for your job, you say, hey, what do you mean? I'm working at McDonald's. That's still the best tool is worship because God is in you. That way you develop the culture that God wanted you to develop while you're there. Amen? So if you're going to develop a culture at work, you've got to have worship in you, which is why personally I believe that at every business seminar that I do, we've got to have some heavy-duty worship as a part of that thing. Somebody says, well, this is a business conference. We're not going to worship here. I said, yeah, but this is a Christian business conference. We are going to worship here because we've got to have worship as a part of our mindset of what work is all about. So the same word, worship and work. So Vines says our understanding of worship comes close to the Hebrew word meaning, the Hebrew meaning of abadah, which is sometimes translated work. The other word, shamar, is to put a guard or to be a watchman. Now, when you think of watchmen today, we usually think of intercessors. You all familiar with intercessors? Businesses are beginning to understand they need intercessors. A few years ago, we didn't even use intercessors. I mean, Intercessors have always been a part of the body of Christ, but I can remember 15 years ago, nobody's talking about intercessors. I remember the first conference we did with intercessors. We said, wow, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to pray. Well, where? Oh, we'll put them in a room, and they'll pray while we're in here. What? Well, they're going to miss the conference. No, they're not going to miss the conference. They're going to hear from God on behalf of the conference. And we began to develop a whole mindset of intercessors praying through conferences. Then intercessors now become a part of, of conferences wherever we go, and now intercessors are becoming a part of work business places, businesses that I know are hiring intercessors onto their staff. So there are some businesses right now that will hire you as an intercessor. Hey, what a job to have. I get to go to work and pray and get paid for it. I could see a whole new division opening up here in the school, intercessors for the workplace. We've got a lot of people that will, hey, I would love to get paid to pray all day long. How many of you want to be? Yeah, that's what I thought. We, we've got all kinds of intercessors here in this place. In fact, those of you that were never intercessors before just became an intercessor right now. You mean I could get paid for this stuff? Wow. Well, what's happening is we're discovering that the role of intercession at work is because of this word, to, put a, to be a watchman. God wants us to develop this watchman mentality. What's an intercessor at work do? They pray and hear the voice of God for the next move. They come to the, the management of the company and say, you know what, I think God is saying this, this, and this. The company begins to put into place principles based on that. And God is now directing the company, not just the management team. Intercessors don't need, and most intercessors don't like, a list of prayer requests. 
They would rather go in the room, hear from God, here's what God said, this is what, and then go and give it. And quite honestly, that's the role of the intercessor. By the way, the intercessor's role is not to implement that. That's management's role or pastor's role or city preacher's role, whatever. But it's to hear from God and give the information, then go back and hear from God, get more information. It's an awesome thing. So we're raising up intercessors for the marketplace right now. One of the first times this happened that I know of was with a friend of mine in Minneapolis, and uh, God had given me this word for this guy, and it, he was a new friend of mine, and I was new in receiving prophetic words. So I was real hesitant because I thought this was a life-changing word for him. The result of it was that he hired an intercessor for his company. Now, if you have an intercessor for your company, where do you put them? He put her at the receptionist desk. So the first person in to the company meets the intercessor. The first, every time you phone in, the intercessor answers the phone. Every, every entry door to that company was through the receptionist, and she was the paid intercessor for the company. So she's working half time at the receptionist desk. The other half the time, the company has been told, Brenda is here praying for you. If you have any needs, she'll be in this office. Go in there in the afternoon. And they'd go in and meet with Brenda, and Brenda would then pray for them. So here's five or 600 employees in the company. No pressure, but if you have a need, she'll pray. And, and we began to develop intercessors in the workplace. Now, out of that, we're beginning to see a whole movement ar arise. A lot of times, the intercessors for a workplace are called chaplains because chaplain is a word that fits better in some people's mind than intercessor. I personally like the intercessor word, but if you're in a business setting, you can hire a chaplain, and it's acceptable because even the Senate has chaplains, hospitals have chaplains, so a chaplain for the workplace makes sense, but they're still intercessors what they really are. But they're there to put a guard or to be a watchman over that workplace setting. Okay, now let's go on here. I want to try to finish. Uh, what time is it? I have 8.30. Is that right? Or is my watch still on California time? Okay, I'm still on California time. I just want to make sure that you're with me here. So it's not 8.30 anymore. It's 10.30. Okay, let's go on through here. So now, now it says here in verse 16, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. And I wrote down by that the word provision because God wants to give provision to you. And then verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. And I wrote the word lack beside that. So you've got God's promise of provision. Now think of this, we're still in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 3 is where man sins and where the, the result of the fall come in. In Genesis 2, where God has set up a plan for work, he says, hey, I'll just give you every tree of the garden you may freely eat. God's desire for your life is to provide every need that you would ever have. That's his desire. He wants to give you what you need. Now, needs are, I mean, we can, we can talk a lot about what needs really are. You can say, well, all I need is a house. Well, you don't really need a house. You could live in a cave. So, I mean, w w what are your needs? But I believe that God wants to give abundant provision to you, even beyond what you need. I think God's desire. So I think here of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. That's God's provision plan for you. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. When you disobey, lack comes in. Now, I don't want to say that everybody that's living in lack today, it's a result of disobedience. But on the other hand, here is God's plan. Follow me, provision. Don't follow me, lack. Now let's go on to the next slide and begin to see how this plays itself out. Chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, it says, Cursed is the ground for your sake. Now, when man sinned, this is after Adam and Eve sinned. I kind of skipped through all that. You understand it, right? They, they sinned, they fell. And here's the result of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Now, I said to you a minute ago, can you, when you see the word ground, don't think ground as in farming, because we're not farmers, but think ground as in what brings your provision. So whatever your source of provision is right now, I want you to put 
that there instead of ground. Whatever your source of provision is, your job, somebody that loves you and supporting your, your family, whatever it might be, I want you to put that in there and name that as your ground. Okay, are you with me? Notice that God did not curse Adam and Eve. He cursed their provision. He cursed that which would give to them what they needed. So their provision was cursed. And then he said, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. In other words, your ground is now cursed so that you are now going to have to toil which was never a part of Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, God did the hard work and we just came along beside him. Now in Genesis 3, the hard work falls to us. The result of our sin was that your provision got cursed. So now in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And then he adds this, in the sweat of your face, and he goes on, uh, all the days of your life, this is going to be the way it is which is where our world has determined that it would be okay to live. In other words, most of us are living under the curse. In fact, most people read that and says, well, it says there that it's going to be there all the days of your life. So I'm stuck with it. I'm stuck with the result of the curse. How many of you believe we're stuck with the result of the curse? We're not, folks. The curse was broken when Jesus died. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, became a curse for us, he broke the curse that kept us out of heaven and now gives us a way back to him. That's what happened. That's the, those that were lost. But that which was lost was the Genesis 2 mindset of work, where work is hard work on God's part and cooperation on my part. We lost that, and it's now possible to restore it completely to our mindsets again today. It's possible to get this totally back into our lives so that we are operating fully under a broken curse or the uncursed society. Now, as I think about it, most people I know are still living under the curse. Most people that I know believe that hard work is a God-given mandate. Most people that I know believe that the harder you work, the further ahead you get. The old American mindset, the, all, the American work ethic, the harder you work, the more you succeed. Now what that does is it puts you under the curse. Now, I told you, I believe in work. I believe it's God's call for your life. I don't believe that 80-hour weeks are God's plan for you. I don't believe that stress is God's plan for you. I don't believe that tension at your work is God's plan for you. I don't believe that working hard enough to get a heart attack at age 50 is God's plan for you. I don't think that high blood pressure is God's plan for you. I don't believe that it's right to say, I earned it all by the sweat of my brow. Because that just, when you hear somebody say that, what they're saying is, I earned it all under the curse. Hallelujah, I'm a cursed person. Hey, you know, I don't want to live under the curse. I don't want to earn it all by the sweat of my brow. I want to get the blessing of God in me so that I can get, listen to me, twice as much done in half the time. Is it possible? That's the Genesis 2 mindset. God does the hard work. I come alongside. He blesses what I do. He gives me an ability to accomplish more in less time. That's God's plan for your work. But most of us are still content to just get stressed about everything. And we live in a stressful society. And if you're not stressed, people think you're somehow or another not working hard enough. You should be stressed like the rest of us. Why are you not stressed? Well, because I'm resting in the peace of God. Oh, it means you're lazy. No, I'm not lazy. I'm resting in the peace of God. It means you're not a hard worker. No, I'm a hard worker. But I'm not going to kill myself with my work when I know if I can get in line with what God's doing, he'll do the hard work. I like to ride my bicycle. How many of you ride bicycle? 
not a motorcycle, the one you pedal. See, I like to ride bicycles. So I live in San Jose, California, so I was riding to Los Angeles. It's 465 miles. So this little week-long trip from San Jose to L.A. Just enjoy riding my bike. Now, I'm big enough that when I go uphill, I go real slow. But when I go downhill, I can fly. I mean, my weight on a bike downhill, and you know, we're really going. So I'm going up a hill, seven miles long. The hill is seven miles long. And I know the seven-mile hill is coming. I'm prepared for the seven-mile hill. So I'm getting geared up for it, and I'm going up this hill. Now, on a bicycle, for me, uphill is like four or five miles an hour. Downhill, I can go 40, 45 miles an hour. Uphill is real slow. I'm going up this hill. Flat, good speed is 15. I'm going up this hill at 19 miles an hour. Uphill, 19 miles an hour. I'm feeling good. I'm working. I mean, I'm sweating, but it's feeling good. I, I was going, I looked down at my speedometer. I'm going 19. I think it. This can't be uphill. I'm looking behind me. Yeah, I'm going uphill. Look ahead. Yeah, it's uphill. What was going on? Anybody have an idea what was going on, why I was going so fast up the hill? Had a tailwind. You get a tailwind, it'll push you up the hill. And what I figured out was that's what God wants to do with your work. He doesn't want you to not work. He wants you to get where his wind is blowing. You get in the tailwind, you get God's tailwind blowing on you. You're still working hard, but you're getting there three times faster. You're accomplishing more, but you know, with that kind of energy, when I was expending that energy, I got to the top of that hill, I was exhilarated because, man, I'd gone up fast. If I stress my way up the hill at four miles an hour, I get to the top, I'd throw the bike down, lay on the ground, huff and pant and wonder if life is worth it. But when, I, but I, when I'm blown up the hill, man, I get to the top, hallelujah, I mean, I'm shouting. That's what happens when you get to work and you get God's work with you and God's tailwind blowing you, that's his plan. No longer Genesis 3, but back to Genesis 2. In fact, usually in life you want to move forward, but in this case you want to move backward. You want to move from Genesis 3 back to Genesis 2. If we can, we want to move out of the curse, back to the pre-curse, and how do you get there? You get there by the cross. Jesus, Galatians 3, 13, Jesus became the curse for us, broke the power of the curse from us. Therefore, when I go to work, I do not have to go in there with this stress-filled mindset that, okay, I'll be the first one to work, I'll be the last one to leave. I won't take any breaks, I won't take any vacations because I am needed. You know who you're kidding when you do that? None of your coworkers, just yourself. And you're not kidding God because he knows that you're not working with his power behind you. Is it possible that your boss could someday recognize that you're valuable even though you don't work all the hours that others do. I tell you what, in today's society, absolutely. I know a lot of people today whose bosses have said to them, the important thing is to get your work done, not that you're here from nine to five. Get your job done because I know that if you get it done, I don't care what you do. And when you get the power of God behind you, he gives you creative ideas plans, strategies, empowers you, enables you to do more in less time, and you can work half time for full-time salary. Now think about it. If you could get a job where, they, where you worked half time for full-time salary without charging the, quote, ministry anything, you could serve God half the time without ever taking a salary from the church. Wow. That's cool, isn't it? So now I want them to pay me. Well, you know, just get your mindset right and let God get involved in the thing and let him take care of it for you. I've got friends, I'm kind of lining up their stories right now of my friends who are working half time for full time salary. And they're just, they're all over the place. And it's because the power of God gets behind them. They've broken the power of the curse off of them See, if you're still living under the curse, there are certain attributes that you will have. You will always be stressed out if you're living under the curse. You're always going to be stressed. I've discovered that when you move into your particular destiny, that energizes you. 
I mean, there's certain things I do that tire me out and other things that I do that I work harder at, but they energize me. Do you know what I'm talking about? When I went to Afghanistan, for instance, I did not have time for that trip. I had a full schedule. I had to slip it in. When I got home from Afghanistan, the next day I flew from California to Ohio for a one-day conference. The next day I flew from there to uh, 700 miles south of Houston to do another one-day conference, home the next day to leave for Indonesia to do a three-day conference, and then leave the next day for Thailand to do a three-day conference and come home to do another conference here. I did all of that and never got tired. I was in, I mean, I was in so many time zones, my body didn't have a clue, but I was never tired. Why was I not tired? Because I was in my area. Of anointing. I was in that which God has given me giftedness for, that which gives me energy. So when I'm in that place, I'm working hard, but I'm getting energy as I go. Now, there are other things. One hour of another thing, and I am shot for the week. I mean, there are certain things that I just don't get energized from. Now, I pastored for 35 years local congregation. I love the local church. I'm on the staff of two local congregations right now. Love the local church. But if I have to go back and pastor a local church, it will just wear me out. Because I, I, that's no longer a part of who I am. I went beyond that time. And if you say to me, you need to pastor a church, man, I'm going to get tired thinking about it. But for 35 years, it energized me. But now that I've moved beyond it, I can't do it. I, when I was pastoring the local church, I love to be around people. So I'd go in my office to study. I'd say, okay, don't interrupt me. I've got to study. And then I'd hear people out in the hallway talking. And I'd open the door. I've got to get out there. What, what's going on? What are you talking about? Because I'm around people. If I'm just in there studying, man, I get tired. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm talking to students that are supposed to be studying. <laughs> forgive me, faculty. Yeah, just forgive me. But, you know, there are ways to get... I mean, there are some of you that will study... <laughs> Oh, man, I'm, I'm messing with you now. There's some of you that will study better at Starbucks than in your, in your room because you've got to be around people. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? You've got to find the area that energizes you. Find the place that energizes you. Some of you need a quiet place to study. Some of you, if you put you in a quiet place, you're going to fall asleep in five minutes. But if you put it out amongst the people, you can read, you can talk, you can read a little bit more, you can talk. You can, it'll come in. Are you, am I right? Does that work for you? See, you find the way that it works for you. Find the part that energizes you and don't fit into somebody else's mindset that you've got to do it their way. Do it your way. When you find your area, that's the Genesis 2 anointing. That's when God energizes you as you're going. It doesn't mean you don't work hard. Don't walk out here saying, Pastor Rich Marshall told us we don't have to work hard. That's not what I said. But what I said was, you don't just work hard, you work with what God is giving you, then his energy is there, you're still working hard, but you get full of energy at the end of the day instead of worn out. Am I talking to people that understand what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying. So that when you get tired from it, there are two things about it. Number one, potential number one is that it's a part of the curse and you're still living with the wrong mindset. Potential number two is that it's not a part of your calling. Because if it's not your call, then find out what your call is. Don't get fit into somebody's mold. Hey, this is ministry, so I've got to do it, even though it tires me out. I can't do it. I hate it. It stresses me. Find the area of ministry that energizes you where you can do it. Some of you are called to preach. Bless God, go preach. Some of you are called to business. Bless God, go be in business, but don't feel guilty either side of that. Find that one which is your calling that energizes you and let nobody put guilt on you because you didn't do what they thought you should do. You've got to find your own place. And when you find your place, there's no stopping you. Because when you get your place, that's the Genesis 2 anointing. That's where eat of any tree you want, because it's going to provide for you. Woo! This is almost good preaching right now. This is almost quit teaching and went into preaching, because we're starting to hit right exactly what you need right now. Okay, now then, I want to take you, before we take a break, to Genesis I'm, pardon me, to Romans chapter 8. And I've got this on the, uh, on the screen, but I want you to see this 
in the context of your Bible. So open your Bible with me to Romans chapter 8. I think I probably preached Romans 8 many, many times over the last 35, 40 years that I've been preaching the Bible. But I've just begun to understand it in the last six months. I've been studying Romans 8 for the last year now. I mean, I really started studying Romans 8 about a year ago. About six months ago, I got, began to get a clue on what it was all about. And now I'm beginning to walk into an understanding of Romans 8. You say, wow, you're kind of slow on learning that. Well, maybe so. But on the other hand, it's really been exciting for me to figure it out. So here we are, Romans chapter 8. Have you found Romans 8? Romans is not hard to find. Verse 19. Now, I've got this up here on the screen. For the earnest expectation of the creation. Now, when you read the word creation, think ground. When you think of ground, think your provision. So whatever it is that's providing for you today, I want you to put that into the word there, creation. The earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Now think about that verse. It says that this morning, outside of you, there is an expectation level that has been rising. See, when you come to school with expectation, you learn more than when you come to school saying, they ain't going to teach me anything today. See, when you go to church and you say, all right, try to get to me. Or if you go to church, Lord, I'm ready. Two different mindsets determine what you receive. So if you come today expecting you're going to receive more than if you don't. Okay, you know that. But the same thing is true. There's something outside of you called your creation, your provision. Somehow or another, in a way that I don't understand, God is able to minister his life into that which surrounds you because... Let's put it this way. God has a destiny plan for you. How many of you believe God has a plan for your life? He has a destiny for you. So when you read the word creation, think destiny. There is an earnest expectation of your destiny that is not you, but it's that which God has planned for you. And it's that spiritual aura that is around you that is raising its expectation level about this morning. That's what this says. The earnest expectation, earnest expectation means there is an excited expectation. There is a tangible, there is a forceful, there is an expectation that says, I'm going to get it no matter what. There's an earnest expectation of your destiny, provision, creation, ground, job, business, calling, whatever you want to put it, that is waiting for, it says here, the revealing, literally the revelation of the sons of God. That's us. Let me put it to you this way. Your creation is saying, I hope she gets it today. Or I hope he gets it this morning. I've been waiting for him to figure this thing out. I've been, I've been laying him clues. I've been giving him outlines. I've been giving him little roadmaps. Maybe today he'll get it. I mean, your destiny has got this expectation that you're about to step into it and stop messing with all the peripheral stuff and move on with what God has for you. There is a revelation that needs to come to you. It's, it's almost like one guy said to me, he said, it's like your dog is sitting down there saying, I got it. Have you got it yet? It's like your dog understands this. Your creation, that which is around you. I mean, everybody understands it, but you. And now God is saying, maybe today. So your creation, your destiny has an expectation about, I say weekend. This is not really a weekend, is it? It has an expectation about today that you're going to receive an understanding of God's destiny call in your life, and you're going to start walking it to the fullest. Now, I guarantee you, whatever your destiny call is, this school is going to help you. Because if you're preparing to be a missionary, a preacher, a worship leader, a youth pastor, or the president of the United States, or the 
the, the uh, superintendent of schools or the lead plumber of your city, you're going to get what you need right here. But what you get here, you need to be able to apply into that destiny call of your life. That's why it's important for you to know what my destiny is. Because scripture can be applied into my calling. Now, not all of your teachers will know what your calling is, but they'll teach you principles that you will be able to apply into your calling. So it's important that you know exactly what it is that God has called you to do. Next verse, the next slide. Verse number 20. For creation, your provision, your destiny, was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him, capital H, Him, God, who subjected it in hope. Verse 20 says that your creation, if you please, your destiny, if you, if you want to put it that way, was subjected to futility. When? Genesis chapter 3 in the curse. Cursed is the ground for your sake. It was subjected to futility, not because it wanted to be subjected, but because God had hope. What kind of hope would God have? God had hope that when Jesus broke the curse, that you would receive that breaking of the curse for yourself, and then you would break it off of your destiny. In other words, it's not enough for you to get saved. You need to now, now that you're saved, you know, nobody can get saved for you. Do you understand this, right? The only way you get saved is you receive it, but on the other hand, the only way you get saved is to recognize the price has already been paid. See, whatever your theology is <coughs> on how you get saved, bottom line is Jesus already did it. And I have to receive it. Now, one church will tell you receive it this way, and one will say you receive it this way, and one will say this happens when you receive it. But we all understand that Jesus did it. So all that we have to do is to receive it. Now, the same thing is true with your destiny. It's been held up in bondage because of the curse, and it's waiting to be released, and the only one that can release it is you. It's a personal thing. I can't release your destiny. I can't come along and say, I break that off of you, you're now free. You have to do it yourself. But when Jesus came into your heart and saved you and set you free, he gave you the power to now set your destiny free. I think that's the hope that God had. When he subjected your creation to futility, he said, I'm going to hold back destiny from her or from him because I believe that when they understand what Jesus did on the cross, they will break it and move into their destiny. That's the hope. God has subjected it because he hopes that we will figure it out. Uh-oh. Are you ready to receive your destiny? Now, depending on your particular emotional makeup, or maybe depending upon your personal church background, you will do this a different way. Some of you will go shout at your destiny. Be free in Jesus' name. I break the curse off of you. You're now free. And others of you will say, thank you, God, that the curse has broken off my destiny. I now set you free. It's okay. I don't think that your destiny gets set free by the loudness or the softness of your voice. I don't think it gets set free by the exuberance of your actions. I think it gets set free by your faith. And if you believe that you have the power today to step out of the curse and into the freedom of the curseless life, if you believe you have that power, then I believe you can do that. Now, if you, see, if I'm talking to a group of business people and they own their own business, I'm going to tell them to go break the curse off the business. I say, hey, you own that thing. It's still under curse. Go break the curse. Because God had a plan for your business to be your provision, and sometimes provision is held back, not because you weren't a good business person, but because it's still under the curse. That's what Genesis 3 tells us. He cursed the ground for your sake. So you got toil and stress and tension and all that kind of stuff. We can break that. But I say the same thing to any of you who have a job. God wants to provide for you. Some of you are working in exorbitant hours for the amount of money you're getting paid. And God wants to set you free from that 
and he wants to move you into a place that will be your provision without the stress. See, I believe that God wants to do that for you so that I think you have the power to speak to your provision source today and say, enough of this curse. I'm going to set you free right now. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to point at you. I'm going to shake my fist at you. I'm going to shout at you, or I'm going to whisper at you, but I'm going to get God's power and effect on you, destiny, so that I am receiving all the provision that God has for me. It's, part of it is just breaking the poverty mindset. Does poverty mindset operate in Bible colleges? Yeah, I thought maybe it did. We think poor students are godly students. Rich students are unholy students. Uh-uh. No, that's, that's not true. See, you, you can be a rich student and be a godly student. You can have all of your needs met. You can have supernatural abundance coming to you. You can have it all flowing to you. Now, tomorrow, I want to talk to you about how it will flow to you because I don't think it will flow to you in the way that you've been taught that it will flow to you. I want to try to establish this. I've never taught it before, but tomorrow, if, if I can finish this this afternoon, I'm going to teach you some stuff I've never taught in my entire life. So we're going to... But I think it's important, and if it works with you, I'm going to teach it everywhere. If it doesn't work, we'll just say, well, that one didn't work. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I believe it enough that I think we can, we can settle some things. So are you ready to speak to your destiny? Okay. Now, let me show you one or two more verses here. Let's go to the next one, verse 21. Because the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty. Look at that, what it says there. It says your creation itself will be delivered how many of you got set free from some bondages when you got saved? Anybody get some bondages broken? When, when I got saved, I was, what, nine years old. So my bondages weren't the same as some, of the, some other people, you know? But when we, people get saved, they get set free from certain bondages. So some of you got set free from some bondages. How many of you got saved like me when you were nine years old? Seven, eight, six, something like that. It's like you've always been saved. You weren't always saved, but it's kind of almost like that. Others of you got saved a little bit later. You, I mean, when God came in, boom, broke things. I remember the day my son got saved. My, my son, raised in a preacher's home, walked in rebellion for a while, from age 18 to age 24. The day he got set free, one night he got set free from demonic attachment, from immorality, from alcohol, and from tobacco in one split second. Never went back to any of it again. I mean, just totally, totally, totally delivered. Completely set free in one moment's time. I mean, six weeks of preaching from his mama and me did nothing. In one moment's time, he got set free from everything. Just complete. It's like your brother last night. It's like, man, we've been praying for him forever, but suddenly out under the stars, boom. I see it, and he gets set free in one moment's time. You know, when God does it, it does not take a long time. Now look at this verse. It says that your creation itself will be delivered from the bondage into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The same liberty you have, your creation gets. If you have been held under a bondage, think of whatever the bondage might be, understand this, your creation is also potentially held under a bondage that has the same strength, but when you set it free, it gets the same liberty that you got when you got saved. Bondage from drugs broken instantly, bondage from poverty broken instantly. That's what it's saying. Bondage from an aimless life broken instantly into your destiny. That's what, I think that's what this verse says. You, do you agree with me as I'm reading through this text? It's just like God is saying to us right now, I want to set you free. Now let's go to the next verse. And then and after this, we're going to pray. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together till now. You ever read that verse before? Here's the way I'm reading it now. The whole creation is your destiny, which is ready to be birthed. It's like, all right, your destiny is saying, all right, oh, wow, she's almost there. I mean, I, I don't know how long it takes for a destiny to be born. I know it takes nine months, 
for a baby, human baby. It takes 24 months for an elephant, it takes, what, a few hours for a rabbit. But it's like, I don't know how long it takes your destiny, <laughs> but your destiny has been held inside the pregnant womb long enough and it's groaning with birth pangs today, saying, okay, long enough, I've been held back long enough, I'm ready to come forth. You say, oh, my destiny can't come till I graduate. Oh, yes, it can. Your destiny can come today. Your destiny can come right now. We don't have to wait till graduation. We don't have to wait till ordination, licensing, commissioning, recognition. God can set you free into it today, and it's like, Right now, your, your destiny is crying out. Now, if you're a woman and about ready to give birth, what do they say to you? Push. Push. And that's what your destiny is saying. <laughs> Come on. Are you a married man? It's just a single guy. He just knows this stuff. Amen. <laughs> Come on, man. I like you because you're always the first one to speak up here. He just... Push and souls are your two strong words today. We got, we got, we're going to push for souls. But I tell you, some of you, you, your destiny is so strong, about ready to come out, it's just waiting for you to say, push. All right, let's stand up right now. We're going to take a break in just a minute, but let's just, in the way that you feel the most comfortable, I want you to speak to your destiny. I want you to break the bondage off of it. The same way that you got saved, I want you to tell it to get saved today. We're going to set you free. We're going to move into your purpose. I'm calling you forth now in the name of Jesus. My creation is groaning together with birth pangs right until this moment, waiting to come out. Your provision is pregnant with your destiny. So let's bring it out right now. Come on, lift your expectation level higher. Lift your faith level higher and start calling it forth now in Jesus' name. Speak to that destiny. Speak to that purpose. Speak to your creation, your provision. Call it forth now. Break the curse off of your life. Break the curse off your provision. Break the curse off your destiny and set it free now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord God, we call it forth now. We speak life to it now. We speak purpose to it now in Jesus' name. Lord, we call forth your everlasting purpose. Thank you, Lord. Come on, point at it, shout at it, pray over it, sing over it, whatever it takes to get it free. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. All right, now, we did an exercise there, but it's probably not completely done yet. I mean, it's like when you got saved, you get saved instantly, right? But usually there's a little bit of buildup before you get saved instantly. So if you got some new revelation today, it might take you a little while to get this whole thing completely set free. But I want to tell you something. You turned a corner right now with your whole destiny, purpose, creation, business, ministry, provision, plan. And God is going to break the bondage that's been holding. For some of you, you've had a bondage that's even kept you from the ability to learn. And that's going to be broken for you. Some of you, you haven't even been able to, to attain to a level of relationship. That's going to be okay now. Some of you haven't been able to get enough money to get you through school, so you're constantly struggling. That has the potential of being broken right now also. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it tomorrow because I don't believe in just the miracle stuff, but I do believe in miracles, but I, the miracles are short. I want some long-term impact. I don't want to live from miracle to miracle. I want to learn how to tap into the superabundance of the Lord. Okay, we're going to take a brief break here. What's brief break mean at BRSM? What's what, uh, 10 minutes? Yeah, what's, uh, uh, I've heard 10 and I've heard 30. Uh, who would go for? <laughs> uh, we'll take it, okay, and now, now Ward says 10 minutes. So here's my question, what does 10 minutes mean at BRSM? Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, take a brief 10 minute break and we'll see you back here in about 15 minutes. <laughs> 